Okay, hi guys and welcome to the show. You join me here in Central Park on a rowboat. <laughs> Where better than to test out a vintage Submariner? Of course, I would love to go on a yacht, but because I spend all my money on watches, I, I don't have a yacht yet, um, probably never will. <laughs> so I've come to New York for a few days. I decided to raid the watch box vaults to borrow something, review it, and you know, my lifelong uh, going towards, uh, let me just, sorry. It's rowing and trying to do a watch review at the same time is not very good. Anyway, um, yeah, so before I left Philly, come to New York to see family, I decided to raid the watch box vaults and borrow something. And of course, my lifelong obsession with the Submariner, I've never actually um, had serious time with a no date, especially a vintage Tudor this important. So without further ado, let's change perspectives, take a look at its history, its specifications, and then we'll discuss positives and negatives. Now I've put it on, um, this strap actually came with my Laurier, incidentally. They got the colors absolutely spot on, so uh, the strap that uh, Watchbox had it on was not my cup of tea, to put it politely. And also this is a one piece um, with the fabric fold over. I just think it really, really, really works. Before we discuss and, and look at this technically, let's have a little look at its history. So the Tudor Submariner started its illustrious history only a year uh, after its bigger, more iconic brother from Rolex in 1954. And in my opinion, uh, no other watch from Tudor perfectly demonstrates and embodies the spirit and story of the brand and how Hans Wilsdorf originally intended it um, to be in relation to Rolex. So just in case you're unaware, Rolex founder Hans Wilsdorf conceived of the Tudor watch company to create a product specifically for authorized Rolex dealers to sell that offered the reliability, quality and dependability of Rolex, but at a lower price. Now, this was not only a, a smart move business wise, uh, but also solved the problem that Rolex kept facing with the ever-increasing demand for their watches. You see, in earlier times, uh, the number of Rolex watches produced was limited by the rate that they could produce the in-house Rolex movements. So therefore, uh, Tudor watches were originally equipped with off-the-shelf movements, um, which of course were more affordable, uh, while using the same similar quality cases and bracelets, and this is why you'll see the Rolex Corona logo on the actual crown of uh, vintage models and Rolex uh, signed on the case back. In fact, my newer uh, late 90s blue Tudor sub is one of the last generations to have this. And it's funny, in videos, people still comment and get confused and think it's a uh, Franken watch, but actually no, it's, um, it's the original crown. So to understand this reference 7928, we have to look at where it fits into the whole scheme of things with the historic 7900 series. This is unequivocally the most formative, influential and crucial first era uh, for the Tudor dive watch. The reference that preceded it was the 7924 um, from 1958 onwards. That was important because it, it doubled the depth rating from 100 meters of the very first Tudor subs to 200 meters. And the 7924 did not, uh, however, have crown guards and was a smaller 37 millimeter size with the automatic caliber uh, 390. So the story for our particular reference starts in 1959 when Trudeau released the first 7928. Uh, but however, they released it initially with unusually angular crown guards. These protectors are often called uh, square crown guards, uh, especially in collector's circles. Inside was the same caliber as before, but this time around, the case had grown to a more contemporary 39 millimeter size. The 7928 underwent several changes throughout the uh, 1960s, and by 1967, we come to our version we see here today, which is very much the final finished penultimate form of the 7900 series. The main distinction compared with earlier versions, which had a minute graduations imprinted within a circle. Now, however, with the last of the 7928s, each individual graduation extends all the way to the flange. And um, 
the circle has been completely discarded. The characteristically gilt Mercedes hands have also been changed to silver this time around. And we saw the change from gilt then to silver inscriptions and printing. And finally, that was all abandoned in favor of white, as we see on um, on this particular version. The evolution did not go unnoticed and it earned Tudor perhaps the highest honor that can bestow a dive watch. Uh, this later 7928 reference is massively important because it was the first to become officially issued by a military organization. And, and nothing uh, immortalizes a watch like when it's chosen um, by elite um, uh, military forces. So the 7928 was adopted by the US Navy in 1964. And with um, these watches being used in some of the most severe of conditions, these military engraved examples are extremely rare. Uh, however, the relative rarity of these um, pieces and their respective stories uh, and the visions they evoke make them highly, highly prized by uh, collectors. So what happened afterwards? Well, from 1968 to 1999, Tudor entered its second great era of evolution for their divers, and perhaps their most dramatic yet. They turned to ETA-based movements. The iconic snowflake hands and square markers were introduced that broke further away from the Rolex aesthetic, and they pretty much forged their own path and identity and um, subsequently were famously issued by the Marine Nationale and many other uh, militaries around the world, uh, which I've discussed at great length uh, in a previous Tudor versus Rolex sub video. Um, Tudor, of course, returned triumphantly in the 21st century for perhaps their greatest third act. And, uh, and we saw endless releases of the Black Bay, they expanded into GMTs, chronographs, and finally going in-house and all the rest of it. So that's where it fits in. So let's actually have a closer look at the watch. We'll start, as always, with dimensions. It is a 39 uh, point uh, 39 and a half uh, millimeter size it is a slightly uh, smaller because the bezel um, does overhang it's quite tall due to that pronounced uh, domed plexiglass which we'll discuss in, in a moment so just a smidgen over 14 millimeters tall lug to lug is 47 millimeters and a fittingly proportioned 20 millimeter lug width so a really fantastic size and it's um, ironic that this watch despite being you know <laughs> Uh, almost 50 years old, or perhaps it is 50 years old now. Um, so many vintage inspired watches are returning to this size. So that's pretty cool. So the entire case is of course stainless steel. We have a very generous signed Rolex Corona crown. This is of course the trip lock screw down crown. It's um, qu still quite large and not as large as the big crown. It's wonderfully uh, ergonomic and really gives you that um, watertight assurance and reminder that you're in safe hands with the Oyster case, of course. The bi-directional dive time uh, bezel with the 60 minute graduations is remarkably flat and uh, unratcheted. So um, the action feels a little bit loose by today's standards, I have to admit, but of course a normal uh, for a watch of this period. The aluminium, I, I suspect, has been replaced because you can see, if I, if I really go in close there, uh, the loom pip there is lighter compared to the rich patina of the um, now ivory cream tritium uh, dial loom markers that oh, just just wonderful. But of course, I could be wrong, um, but I, I doubt it. But I'm not worried because this has been um, replaced by a genuine period correct uh, insert. And while we're talking of condition, it has seen a polish over the years. We have drilled lug holes, of course. Uh, the edges are not crisp. It is quite rounded. Um, however, it is equally done. But you've got to remember this watch is, you know, half a century old. So I think it's forgivable. It's, it's, uh, for me, it's not really an issue. I mean, it would be horrible if it was you know, one lug dramatically thinner or, or thicker than the other, etc. There is still variation from the brushed top of the lugs to the high polished sides. The main attraction here has got to be that darn. And as I move it in the light, you'll see it's uh, naturally and slightly faded matte black, 
but it has that charming grainy texture that is just so exquisite uh, we also get the pre-1969 Tudor rose of course there uh, and that rose as a Brit uh, just takes me back to my childhood visits of Hampton Court Palace Hans Wilsdorf, of course, was a massive Anglophile himself, hence the brand name. And that little bit of uh, England uh, means so much to me to have it on the wrist. That coupled with the lovely curved uh, script of self-winding at the bottom that follows the edge of the dial towards the six o'clock. A cool detail that implies the motion of the rotor. I, I really love that. That sadly they, they've done away with in the modern dials with the in-house uh, calibers. It's just a very subtle, clever little design flair. If we just um, pull back a little bit and look at it from a slight distance, you'll see that the dial also boasts a, a b bewitching line of symmetry, or double line of symmetry almost. Uh, the only thing you know, um, breaking that is of course the triangle, but that's a very deliberate. It's a sharply tipped triangle with a kind of rifle scope, equidistant rectangles. Obviously we have the circles to differentiate um, between the markers. It gives a clear orientation. And we take this, this layout for granted, but um, it has become the default dial layout for so many divers since um, we mustn't forget that. The domed plexiglass is quite incredible. It does give a rather statuesque um, profile to the watch and it does sit tall, but I'm willing to forgive it because the distortions are just, oh my God, um, splendidly pleasing water-like distortions as I, as I twist it. There you go, look at that. It's just magic. And it, sometimes it even magnifies the... Um, details on the dial oh, it's, oh, it's it, it, <laughs> yeah um, it really makes my heart sing if you if you can't tell already but it also sits a little bit taller than the bezel uh, which gives you that instant kind of vintage feel and you immediately notice it before you've even strapped it on and talking of straps um, originally it came on an oyster brushed uh, riveted bracelet but unfortunately the original bracelet doesn't accompany this uh, particular watch but as I'm an absolute trollop for NATOs and Perlons and all the rest of it um, or especially NATOs to me it's not a big deal besides the the bracelets of this era are horribly dated so inside we have the caliber 3 90 which is a reasonably solid and uncomplicated 17 jewel uh, automatic no date movement operating at the very slow uh, 18,000 vibrations an hour thanks to that low speed and relatively robust construction um, they are dependable well obviously I mean they they um, they wouldn't have been chosen by the military otherwise it does have manual wind unfortunately there is no hacking which is rather disappointing to be honest I, I wouldn't have expected that um, in a in, especially in a a reference that has been adopted by the military. So before we take it to the positives and negatives, um, a little little bit of a conclusion, I guess. Uh, what we have here uh, is the ultimate version of the first generation of Tudor Submariner. It's the culmination of 13 years of research and experimentation in the field of dive watches. Um, this model has defined the foundation on which the next well, in what dictated the next 30 years of Tudor Submariner. So, yeah, a very, very cool watch and extremely compelling. Um, but let's summarize it. Okay, so let's start with the positives first. Well, undoubtedly it has the charm of the age. After reviewing so many vintage inspired watches, it's finally nice to get a hold of the real thing. There's a very similitude to it and you feel the history on the wrist, especially of course with the Tudor Rose. I think it's stylish, it's uh, timelessly classic. 
Definitely with the monochromatic uh, color scheme, it is a certified strap monster, which is of course assisted by the drilled lug holes. Something I, I really do appreciate about it is it's very robust. I have to confess, I actually bought an MC4 uh, vintage 1960s blanc pain bathscape not so long ago and then I ended up selling it immediately afterwards. So it's a little manual wine, 34 millimeter, it was um, steel case back, but it was it was nickel with steel plating. You know, when you spend five, six grand on, on uh, yeah, okay, it's historically important, beautiful, beautiful piece, ton of character, but I was so petrified of wearing it, it put me off. And I ended up selling it shortly after uh, buying it just because I, I couldn't really enjoy it. That's something I do uh, appreciate about vintage Rolex and vintage Tudor. With the Oyster case, it is robust enough. I can enjoy it and obviously it's been recently serviced, uh, it's been inspected by Watchbox, so I know that the gaskets are new, I don't have to worry about its, its uh, water resistance or anything like that. Unequivocally, one of its strongest positives has to be the, the sense of history you get. Uh, the fact that it's a part of the evolution of dive watches not just for Tudor, but in, in history in general. It's part of the story of one of the greatest uh, uh, dive watches ever made, and you, you really do feel it. Something we, we have to mention is its value. It has very strong value retention, also because, yeah, it's part of the Rolex family, but, you know, Tudors, they're so collectible now. Do bear in mind, it's several grand cheaper than the Rolex equivalent, and I think that really does matter. And talking of Rolex, it makes a nice change from the rather ubiquitous 5513 reference that is the Rolex equivalent, which incidentally ran for about 25 years. So it gives you really an, uh, more of an idea of how much rarer and special the Tudor is. It being no date, it's more discreet, you don't have the Cyclops, you have that beautiful balance to the dial definitely more low-key and you don't have the stigma of you know the the status luxury watch thing that you get with the rolex it's going to be appreciated more by collectors and especially by people in the know that really appreciate how special this watch is okay so let's discuss the negatives well unfortunately the caliber 390 these days, it's very tricky to source parts for, so the servicing might be in a bit of an issue. If you go with Watchbox or you know a highly reputable seller that has connections and is an authorized dealer for Tudor, then sourcing the parts is going to be less of an issue. But if you're buying this independently or through a dealer, you've got to consider that in mind, um, especially if it hasn't been serviced recently. You might have a little shock in store for you. And this can be really expensive, especially compared to the later ETA models, like my own uh, Tudor sub, which actually, it makes me appreciate a little bit more. Okay, the, the next big negative is the non-hacking. Yeah, it's a product of its day. I can't really complain about it too much. And if we're talking about dated components, the bi-directional bezel, yeah, it hasn't got the most resistance to it. It's gonna turn on its own volition, unfortunately. Uh, it might annoy some. My last little negative is the height. It is rather um, stocky, shall we say. I've got very used to my little uh, 36 millimeter later Tudor sub, which is wonderfully slender. But I have to say, despite its rather commanding presence, the weight is only 70 grams. So the comfort isn't diminished that greatly. Not the end of the world um, because you know, to be honest, all these negatives, you could just forget about it because it's such an enchanting watch. It, it's, so, it's so beguiling, it's so full of history. I'm willing to forgive it and that's why people pay ridiculous amounts for watches like this. At the end of the day, it is pure class. I've really enjoyed my time with it. I do think it is worth the money. Uh, I have to say, I, I really do think it is. Um, but anyway, there we go. Okay guys, so I'm going to leave it there. I bid you farewell from a beautiful dusk here in Manhattan. Please don't forget to add your thoughts, queries, comments, all the rest of it down below. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it, found it useful. And as always guys, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.
Now, before I go, guys, I just want to quickly tell you about this extremely cool app that Watchbox have launched. This is my own personal go-to app for everything watch-related. Using the app, you can keep track of the real-time value of your watch collection. You can store watches in your digital watch box and even try on watches using an augmented reality. So don't miss out and please go to the App Store and download it today. You can access all of my latest videos right there in the app itself. And if you haven't already, please follow me on the official Urban Gentry Instagram and of course the Facebook UGWC. But most importantly of all, keep it positive, onwards and upwards.